this uh, this blog we're going to entitle it when you are down to nothing God is up to something my wife is laughing in the background there <clears throat> when you are down to nothing God is up to something and um, I want to start by just um, helping us to use the scriptures so a couple of verses here that will help us to begin to realize that we need to start recognizing God is even in the worst of things that that that's that's just a fact uh, and in fact when we're called according to his purpose that then he is actively working using all things <clears throat> which we were familiar with that scripture but I want to use a scripture out of uh, this month you should be getting your um, newsletter soon and I, I referred to this verse in that newsletter also um, and uh, it is Matthew 14 verse 23 through 27 Matthew 14 <clears throat> 23 through 27 and when he had sent the multitudes away he went up into a mountain apart to pray and when the evening was come, he was there alone, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And that's uh, interesting wording there, because the waves are tossing them, and the waves are contrary to them. Um, and then it says in verse 25, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Okay, so this just kind of sets up the, the thing that I want to share. Um, here you have a situation where um, it, there's a storm. Uh, this is similar to the storms of life and the things that we go through and the troubles that we face and the things that are going on. And the disciples are in a, uh, as we pointed out, waves, waves. You know, waves are, <clears throat> you know, one wave is one thing, but waves of, things that are rolling and hitting you is another thing. <clears throat> and then uh, the wind being contrary to them. And so they're dealing with, with contrary circumstances. And so they're in the boat and, and all of a sudden in the midst of this storm, and it, and it says, you know, they, you know, they were really going through it. And in the midst of this storm, you know, I, I'm sure the way it kind of looked was at first it's just the storm, and then they see, they see something in the storm begins to appear to them, and it says, uh, and, it's, uh, and it says, uh, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. They were troubled, saying, "It is a spirit," and they cried out for fear. And this is. This is the way we handle a lot of circumstances and things. We don't see Jesus in the storm. We don't see Jesus. In fact, we, we not only don't see Jesus, in reality, what is Jesus in that storm, we take it as an evil spirit. We take it as something that is coming to hurt us and to destroy us and uh, in the midst of this storm. And, and we never really see the Lord uh, and that, that, that the Lord is in this, right there. The Lord is in this, but our minds and our fears are at work. And as I said, I've, I've addressed this somewhat in my newsletter for this month. Um, and, um, and so they're, they are flung into deeper fear, not just by the storm, but now I knew it, this storm is of the devil. This storm is, has uh, uh, demonic things in it. And we're, we're calling Jesus that. We're calling Jesus this spirit. And, uh, and now we're worse than the storm. We're contrary to Jesus. The wind was contrary to us. We're contrary to Jesus. And we don't recognize him. 
we're too busy. We were already put in that mindset because of the storm. Because well, no, most Christians go, well, no storm is of God. This can't be of God. This is horrible. This is a horrible circumstances. God wouldn't allow this. So that mindset already puts us into a position to misread Jesus, to have him appear to us, but we don't, we don't see him, even when he's appearing there. And so uh, it's, a, it's along those lines that I want to go ahead and share, and I want to share about the, uh, the life of Joseph, but it is factually true that if you go through any major person in the Bible, um, the greatest stories that we draw out from are, you know, Jonah in the whale, or Joseph down in Egypt in the pit, or, or uh, we just go through all of them, and they have to, you know, David going up against Goliath, something, he's a little kid, he's too weak, he's too, and this thing is so much greater, and it's always, um, it's always a crisis out of which comes the greatest manifestations of Christ and the greatest growth for us and the greatest heart of God to be um, fulfilled and reached because we, we not only see him in the storm, we understand what he's doing. Yeah. We're with him in it. All right, so uh, Joseph's life in Genesis um, uh, 37 and we'll just read first verses, starting with verse 3 through 7. Now Israel, Israel being the father of Joseph. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all of his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. And he begins to describe it. But but in this early age, this is this is where he's at the height of everything that's that he, that most Christians try to attain to. He's he's young, he's loved by his father. Uh, he's wearing this coat of many color, which is a display of of the father's honor to him and love to him, and uh, uh, and as you know, God is declaring him openly, um, and uh, he's got a blessed life, and he's blessed by God. He's not just blessed by his father; he's blessed by God. Uh, he has uh, really cool dreams. You could call them dreams of grandeur, but they're still really cool if grandeur is where you want. And, uh, and the future looks bright. But in that same chapter, uh, Genesis 37, verse, first verse 18 through 20, <clears throat> And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. They conspired, they wanted to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this behold, this dreamer cometh. This dreamer cometh. And that's important to them, and it's important to this whole situation. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him, and cast him into some pit. And we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. See, and they're reacting. They're reacting to to these dreams. Um, and then now look in verse 26 through 28. <clears throat> and Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his breath? blood? Come, and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Then, then there passed by Midianite merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Okay, so now the situation, we're seeing that the, the, the beautiful time that he had is all turning. Um, and, and you would think that the most 
that the most glorious time to God was that time in Joseph's life when he had the coat of many colors and when he had the, all these blessings and things. And yet, in truth, without, without the cross and without these things, there, there is nothing. There is, there is nothing that's come out of this yet that is important to the Lord. Um, and there's no, nothing that's come out of Joseph because he hasn't seen the Lord in him. Right now, all he sees is like the disciples in the boat, seeing the storm, then seeing Jesus, but not seeing Jesus, and they just see an evil spirit. And this is what was once good times are now bad times because he's not mature enough to comprehend that. Okay, Genesis 39, uh, verse 16 through 20. <clears throat> and this is after he's been taken down in Egypt. So, so what we just read was that the brethren, the 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 brethren turn against him, and in so doing, they um, do these things against him, which, which, you know, is to destroy him in the eyes of the Father, whether it's death or whatever. But now, down in Egypt, he gets put in the house of Pontifer, and things start looking better, see? And so we start going, oh, praise God, things are looking better. Pontifer likes me, and all of this kind of stuff, and... You know, it's going to go back to what it was. I know it is. Because we want to all go back to the Garden of Eden. See, We don't want to go to the Garden of Jesus' heart. We want to go to the Garden of Eden. And that's where we want to live because it makes us happy. Not because it makes Him happy. Genesis 39, verse 16 through 20. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. <clears throat> And uh, verse 17, and she spake unto him according to these words, saying, the Hebrew, she's talking to her husband now about this incident that happened with Joseph. The Hebrew servant, which thou hast brought unto us, came in unto me to mock me, and it, and it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke unto him, saying, after this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put in him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. And okay, so, so now the bright, beautiful future and the great turn that God was bringing about to justify Joseph because of the meanness of his brothers, all of a sudden it's turned worse. I mean, it's one thing to be thrown in a pit. And then to be taken out of the pit, sold unto Ishmaelites, taken down into Egypt, it's, it's another thing to be thrown into the deepest dungeon pit of, of Egypt. Okay, so, um, uh, so then in between that time and, and what we're about to read comes this new phase where um, the, the Pharaoh has a dream and no one can interpret it. And, um, and, and Joseph hears from God and he, and he hears what no man can hear from God. And he, he interprets that and it's all in relationship to the butler and the whatever, the baker and the Indian chief. And, uh, and so this, there is this um, hope that begins to arise now that is, you know, coming from this place of self. Hope arising from this place of hope for self. And so, this is Genesis 40. Verse 14 and 15 first. Genesis 40, verse 14 and 15. But think think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness. So this is what he's saying to the one that was raised up uh, and coming out of the dungeon. I, and, sh and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me. Think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed, 
I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also have I done nothing, have I done nothing, that they should put me into the dungeon. All right. So he's telling this to the butler because the butler's the one who's, who's, who got out. And, and really, you know, it's all due to Joseph. But Joseph is still, he still thinks, how shall I say, he still thinks wrong about the way things are supposed to go. He thinks that it's all about him and God, and him for God, and him being blessed, and him, you know, being being obvious to everyone that God blesses him and uses him and you know that coat of many colors is long gone now though and um, and so he's 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 pleading for that old life and that feel and that happiness and that joy he doesn't know does, doesn't know the joy of, of blessing the Lord he only knows the joy right now of him being justified and rectified and honored. All right. Um, and then verse 23 of that says, Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. Okay. <clears throat> so, wow, this is tough. This strikes, this strikes deep into Joseph. And he realizes that uh, things are, uh, things have changed. Now, he, now he's not young, he's older. Uh, now he's not honored, he's rejected in a prison. Uh, now he's not blessed of God. He, you know, the only thing is God seems to do stuff for other people at this stage. And, uh, and all of those dreams... None of the words that he was given are coming to pass, and he has no future. Oh, no. You know, anybody remember when you get all them words and you go, oh, I'm going to be great? <laughs> anyway, so Joseph's far down in the dungeon, and I'm sure this, you know, you have it from other people in the Bible, but I'm sure he thought, I wish I were dead. Um uh, you are dead with Christ. You are dead. You don't need to wish it. You're dead with Christ. You need to, need to grow in the reality of that, and these things won't affect you as you move towards what God really has for you. So, here he's sitting there, and he's thinking about, you know, the benefits that he brought to the, to the butler and the, the other people and the things that have happened. And... And uh, the dreamer has come to the realization that he has no more dreams about himself, but for others, but for the butler, but for Pharaoh, but for all of Egypt, but for this wonderful thing that happened after this, where he heard from God, and the, the wonder of the change that starts happening in him when he realizes all the dreams that I had for me are not important. Now, these God has given me dreams and they're blessing whole nations. And in fact, the dream didn't bless Egypt alone. It fed the whole world because of a change of spirit and a change of heart. So, so in reality, God is blessing Joseph at his lowest point. He, that's what he's doing. He's blessing Joseph at his lowest point, but others are being raised up. And, uh, and that's, frankly, that's the same thing he does for us at the cross. He brings us down into death so that that seed of Christ can fall into the ground and die, and we can be a blessing to others at our own, at our own expense. Um, we are... So we are demoted in blessing and promoted in prison. So my title was, When You Are Down to Nothing, 
God is up to something. So I want you to remember that story of Jesus in the storm. I want you to remember that he brings these things on us for something greater. And in that case, he'd like for us to see him in the, in the storm. And not just assume that it's the devil or some other kind of a spirit and fight against it. But to find Christ and him crucified in a way that will change lives. Let's pray. Father, bless your word. Bless your people. Be blessed. Be blessed by those of us who embrace your cross and your nature and seek your heart and seek the Lamb. We ask in Jesus' name.